everyone, and welcome to this new quarantine-inspired show called Hanging with Her. This is a time uh, I hang and have a candid conversation with some of my valued friends. And today, welcoming a good friend who played 11 seasons in the NBA, five-time All-Star, two-time Defensive Player of the Year, who was greatly, by the way, admired by Michael Jordan, and a Naismith Basketball Hall of Famer, my friend number four, Sidney Moncrief. How are you doing, Sidney? Hey, Coach Herb. How are you doing today? Man, I'm doing good, and I'm happy to have you here um, joining with us and, and just going to have some good conversation with you. Why not? Right. So first, I always start out with talking about how uh, about us, how I know you, you know me. And uh, if, I'm, I forget the year. But uh, you, uh, you uh, approached me. I was the high school varsity coach at American Heritage Academy. Uh, and you approached me uh, about a summer camp, a summer basketball camp that you had and was going to bring to our, to our school. And I said, absolutely. And uh, do you remember the year that was? I don't remember, but it's the early 2000s. It was. It was. And uh, you and your family. And you brought coach, your brother and coaches in. And we had an awesome group of young men and women, uh, girls and boys of all ages that came and, and learned uh, for a good, uh, good week of, of fundamental basketball. You remember that very well? Oh, yes. Well, I'm thinking it was 2004, between 2004 and 2006. Somewhere in there. I was coaching, I was coaching with the Mavericks, assistant coach with the Mavericks, 2000. To 2003, so I, it was after that little stretch. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, another way we we knew each other is uh, I coached against your brother, who was at the the basketball camp. Uh, Doyle, he was coaching the Dallas Thunder, and uh, and I I really really expect excuse me I really really respected uh, the way that he coached his style and how he could take a little talent and just make them play so, so well together. He was just an amazing coach. Well, Coach Herb, that's what he loved doing. He, he loved, first of all, he's very passionate about coaching and teaching, especially the fundamentals. He was oh. like, yeah, fundamentals. And he, he stayed with the Thunder because of his commitment and relationship with those kids and building those kids up, becoming a mentor and coaches are mentors. He was the finest example of the combination of mentor, yet being disciplined enough and holding them accountable enough to still be their coach and to get a lot out of their talent. And we discussed when we talked last week that Doyle passed away two years ago uh, of a mysterious, mysterious uh, condition that we still hadn't figured out, but he is forever in our spirits as a great coach and a tremendous brother. Absolutely, I I had no idea until you know, like until we talked. But um, when the school actually closed in two thousand nine, AHA, uh, uh, there was a couple of our players that went and played for him. That was at AHA, uh, and uh, and and I would invariably see him at a tournament, at a game, somewhere, and we'd always. Uh, enjoy time together. He was a great guy and uh, just a, a real solid basketball coach. I really he was. He was. He, he, he's missing. He was my he was my basketball arm because even though obviously I can coach basketball, my body don't allow me to. <laughs> you know how they just coach her up that that court's pretty hard. <laughs> it's really hard on your body unless it's an NBA court or or top of the line college court. I agree. I agree. Now, the other time that we met, uh, we happened to just run in, into each other at the DFW airport headed to Las Vegas. Do you remember that? Yes, yes, yes. We headed to Vegas. Those were some, God, they had so many basketball games in Vegas back then. It was, what's that, in, that was in the summer, wasn't it? That was in the summer. It was the, well, it was the NBA All-Star Weekend. And yeah. we were heading there. I was oh, yes, yes, yes. I remember. Yes, that was the that was the messiest All Star game ever, as far as uh, the crowds 
and the people at the airport, especially trying to leave. Yeah. 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 I was I was coaching with the Fort Worth Flyers during that time. At that time. And I was also the coach of the All Star team for the. Uh, back then, it was called the D League for the G League. So we played. I, I coached my game, and we had a practice Monday evening. So I said, "Okay, I do my game. I get out Sunday." In the airport, the lines were so long. Missed my flight, and the next day, got on a flight. Had to go to Austin. Had to fly to Austin and then drive to Dallas just to get back. <laughs> it was a mess. <laughs> I remember uh, you, you know, I, I had the number so we communicated and uh, you were leaving early and you told me, hey, I got tickets to this, 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 all your, you left me a packet full of stuff and we just had a wonderful weekend. Yeah, it was a good weekend. Oh, and all my sons were able to attend that All-Star weekend. And, and, oh, okay. And normally, I don't go to any events. I give my tickets. If I have tickets, I give my tickets to my sons, or I give my tickets to friends, or I sell my tickets, either or, and just there for part of the weekend, but not necessarily for the game itself. Right, right. Well, awesome, awesome. And uh, tell, okay, what, this, 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 why don't you share with us just a little bit about yourself? Why don't you start from your birth city, where you were born, and bring us up through high school, college, and uh, what you're doing now. Little Rock, Arkansas was where I was born, 1957. Product of the Central High School crises back to desegregation or integration of Central High School. Went to school in Arkansas and Little Rock. Went to, I went to four different elementary schools. Can you believe that? Four different elementary schools. Two different high schools. I mean, junior high schools. And then went to Hall High School. Graduated from Hall High School was a pretty decent basketball player. Got drafted, well, I was recruited by University of Arkansas along with other schools and decided that I wanted to stay home. University of Arkansas played there four years, back in four years, back when it was okay to play four years. And I, we really didn't think we were good enough to play. It's the next level until you- the Next level in three years or even two years. Right. So four years was okay with me. I didn't have a problem with that. And a funny thing happened, I just kept, I tell people, you, you just just realize where you are. Mm -hmm. and get better every day at your craft, without projecting too far in the future about what you're going to going to be. Because an NBA player was not high high on, on my radar. I wanted to be the best high school player I could be. Then I wanted to be the best college player that I could be. And as that philosophy did well by me, because once I got to the NBA, I had developed the discipline of staying in the now, getting better right now, not being concerned about all these external factors that I didn't control. And because of that, I would have never thought I would end up being a Hall of Fame basketball player or all pro, all star, all those good things happen. Coach Herb, because I stayed in the now and I, I kind of, knew the value of just getting better, get better at your craft every day. Every day. Every day. And then I played 10 years in the NBA, retired, and decided, guess what? I can still play a little bit. I think I can. So I want to play some more. So I played one more year with Atlanta. Then I was done. I was definitely done. Nobody wanted me after that. I was done. When nobody signed you to a contract in, in pro sports. You're done. Yeah. <laughs> so I was at that point. It ended up doing the entrepreneurship, had dealerships, about three dealerships that I opened throughout the course of the next seven to eight years. Had an opportunity to coach at University of Arkansas Little Rock, a mid-division one school. Took that opportunity. From there, the Dallas Mavericks approached me, wanted me to be an assistant coach. I coached under Don Nelson with Dale Harris and Dunny Nelson, Mark Cuban, uh, Orlando Blackman, great coaching staff, Charlie Parker. Uh, we had a great staff. That's how Orlando Blackman was on our staff. So I did that for three years, went back to the car business because I'm an entrepreneur at heart. At heart, I'm sort of an independent type person that like to create things and help people. Right. So I went back to uh, I went back to being an entrepreneur. And I did that for about four years. And in between, I coached for the D-League team, Fort Worth Flyers. Then I went to China 
for 18 months as a consultant. Really? Coach for the Golden State Warriors after that assistant coach. I went from Golden State to China. Wow. Yeah, it was a pretty big transition because when I was in when I was in transition, I had an opportunity to go to China and work for the Beijing organization with their youth. They liked the work that I did and they said, would you like to come on years later, a year later? They said, would you like to come on as a consultant for our pro team? At that time, I was an assistant coach for the Golden State Warriors, had a big decision to make. And I said, you know what? Mm, you pay me this much money, I think I'll come. <laughs> and coach Herb, they said, okay. <laughs> I said, I said, uh, Okay, okay. I learned to speak a little Mandarin. Uh, so I, I was there 18 months. All right. Came back, started my business again, and the Milwaukee Bucks had a position open as an assistant coach. And you kind of wonder, okay, you only have so many opportunities to do to coach in the NBA because after a while you're out of sight, out of mind. This was another opportunity to coach in the NBA. So I went to, to went to coach with Scott Skiles with the Milwaukee Bucks where I played. After that, uh, two years, I went back into my business, which I've been doing ever since. We are, we are a people development company. We do cutting edge delivery and design of content in the area of, areas of team enhancement, leadership, emotional intelligence, entrepreneurship, workplace readiness, and diversity and inclusion. So that's what, that's what I do now. I do workshops and I do uh, training for youth and for adults. Wow. I know that's a lot. <laughs> you have you have done it just about all. So you know, I have a I have a ton of experiences. And I think that's what makes me effective as a people developer with these companies and schools and organizations is because I've experienced a lot of success and as much failure. And I can I can understand both both sides of it and i can put that into a way that people can understand and appreciate amazing amazing well i got some pictures here that uh that i'm gonna pull up and uh, let's just talk about uh some of the pictures that i that i've gathered here for you um one we'll start off with with you with your family i think that is hold on let's go back let me go back one yeah. Tell me who you, who we got there. Oh yeah, you got Doyle, my youngest brother, and my mom, Bernie Perkins. Uh, Coach Herb, my mom died July sixth of two thousand eighteen, and Doyle died July 9th of two thousand eighteen. So they died within three days of each other. That was her favorite child, so it was very appropriate that they they uh, leave together, which they did. And uh, down here, I don't know who these, this is Doyle's team. That's Doyle's this, team down there. I, I, yeah, I, I that's Doyle's team. Yeah, and I, I want to put that on there because of um, the relationship. Man, uh, just looking at him just brings up such great memories of, uh, of talking with him and, and, and laughing with him. And, and we just had just a great relationship, you know, a short time when we would see each other. Yeah, it looks like, like Gavin, but... Uh, some of these young men, they definitely, they were attending the funeral uh, Doyle service. Okay. 2018. Sure did. Awesome. Uh, all right. I, let's talk about, talk about these pictures here. Oh, that's a collage of a lot of, a lot of good memories right there. The middle picture of, is when we played Texas 2000, I'm sorry, 1978. And uh, we knew Sports Illustrated was at the arena. We knew that. We knew they were doing an article. We did not know where the article would fit in their magazine. And we certainly didn't think the cover would be part of what they would do. Right. Uh, but when I was, I had stolen the basketball and I had a knee problem. And I remember going up, Coach Herb, and people look at the expression on my face and say, God, it's so intense. But I was, Wishing because of pain. My knee, my knee just about gave out when I went up to dunk the ball. Wow. And so I went up. I know I was a one-foot jumper, not two. I jumped off one leg. So I went off that leg, and the weakness and the pain just hit me. And that's why you see that expression on my face. It's like, ouch! <laughs> and uh, 
yeah, the cover, this was the cover shot for, as you know, for for that magazine. Wow. Were you ever on the cover again? I was on the cover with the Milwaukee Bucks in 82. Okay. Uh, not, not as impressive of a photograph. <laughs> and to the left is a special photograph of when they retired my number at Arkansas. It's actually the second retirement of my number. They retired my number in, in the 90s. And when, but they never took it, they never moved it, removed it from Bud Walton, I mean, from uh, uh, Barnhill, where we used to play, to put it in the new arena, which was Barnhill. Ah. So the only retired jersey in the history of basketball, they didn't retire football jerseys back then, <laughs> but the only retired basketball jersey was mine. And it was it was stuck in the women's basketball facility because they didn't move it over. <laughs> because Frank Rawls, outstanding AD. Okay. But he's a football guy. And when Coach Sutton forced him to retire my number, he was like, We don't retire numbers here at Arkansas. We we never retired football players' numbers. We never we're not retiring anyone's number. But Coach Sutton somehow forced him to retire my number. <laughs> and he did. But the revenge was when we moved to our new arena, it's staying in the old place. So they had a, a ceremony where they did Nolan Richardson, Eddie Sutton, Sidney Moncrief, Corliss Williamson over the course of the year. And this is the second retirement of the number in Bud Walton Arena. And the pitcher to the down below is Marvin doing what he does best, which is shoot the basketball, never, never pass. He only passed when it slipped out of his hands. You've heard that before. Because if it slips, it's a pass. Otherwise, it's going up one of the best shooters, in my opinion, in the history of basketball. Wow. And I'm not biased. He could just flat out shoot the basketball. And then to the bottom, my bottom right, number 10, Ron Brewer, in my opinion, uh, one of the most talented players in the history of the University of Arkansas. From the time Ron was in high school, he played for Coach Gail Condart. Disciplinarian taught the fundamentals. They won the championship that year, his senior year. They beat Marvin's team in the in the uh, overall final in Little Rock, Arkansas, which at that time was the largest crowd to watch a high school basketball game in the state of Arkansas. <clears throat> but Marvin's coach, Coach Taylor, was also a very good coach. And then my coach, Oliver Elders. And people sometimes ask me about the triplets. We were called the triplets and what made it special. And Coach Herb, I said what made us special was we all had just very, very, very good high school coaches, Coach Elders, Coach Condock, and Coach Taylor. And then you can see us down below. That picture was taken at, a, at an event, a three-on-three -three basketball event, right after I went to the NBA in the early 80s. And then look at that. We go from the 80s all the way to last year. They were doing a, a documentary on Coach Eddie Sutton. We were in Fayetteville, Arkansas, so we had the opportunity to take a photograph together. And we were together in June, I mean, in January of this year for a triplets, day with the triplets basketball event. We stayed connected, the triplets and I, and those are just, well, those are photographs I love. Man, that's, uh, that's amazing. I remember uh, back when I, was, when I was playing, I remember very well the triplets. It was, uh, you guys were big time, big yeah. time. We could just flat out play. Ron, Ron could do it all. Marvin could shoot. And Marvin was, was an all-around good offensive player. He could post up. He could drive. Uh, he was really good. And I was a, a baseline-type player that rebounded well, intensity, speed. It was just a rare combination for a college basketball team. We were all 6'4", all about the same weight. Yeah. Triplets, special time. All right. What we got here now? Yeah, that's the, so we transitioned from the NCAA to the big time NBA with my Eddie Munster haircut at the top with the receding hairline. <laughs> that's going through my, my ritual of stretching every game. Back then, you stretch yourself mostly, and occasionally I would call a trainer or someone to do some specific stretches. But this was a time, Coach Herb, uh, I was very intense and serious about pregame routines. Okay. When, when I did my workout before the game, I would come before everybody else because I didn't want the distractions. And then when I did my warm-ups, 
it was a time for me to get mentally prepared to play. It wasn't joking, laughing, playing. It was stretching, locking in. Here's what I need to do to be successful tonight. And that's what you see in this. It's, it's more than just stretching. Okay. It's preparation to compete. And like you said, it's a mindset. You get in your mind ready. And the top, one of the best defenders in the history of basketball, Dennis Johnson, is guarding me as I go to my left, which I, I have so many photographs of me driving with my left hand. And it's a lesson for those that play basketball. I was all right for years. And I spent the summer working on dribbling a lot, and especially going left. I worked on going left so much and shooting left hand layups, left hand floaters. I wanted my right hand and left hand to be comfortable when I played the game of basketball. And I see very few pictures of me. This when I'm down here, I'm dribbling with my right, but I could go left very well. But Dennis, he's one of the very few players that could, when I would drive, he would reach around me and tap and steal the ball at least once a year. You know what I'm saying? It's like one of those type things. Yep. His time in his hands. I always rate Dennis Johnson, Michael Cooper, Dennis Rotman, and Michael Jordan as the top four, Alvin Robinson, uh, the top five defenders that I face in my 10 years in the NBA. <clears throat> Very good defender. Well. And then down on the right side, my legs are not in the great best position, but Magic is a little too late. He's about to get faced up on that jumper right there. <laughs> too late, Magic. Too late. And, and I, it's a 50% chance it went in because I was a 50% shooter on that shot. I don't like my form very well. And then you know, Jeff Rutland, uh, Ruland, I'm sorry, he's a really good player. And I own him. And there I am. Look at my, look at my right. When I look at my old pictures, Coach Herb, I look at my body position. Oh, okay. I look at uh, like this shot. When I see it, I'm looking, okay, guy, you're shooting a layup underhand. You got that, that other hand kind of protecting the ball somewhat. And then you see my, my foot is just about on his, on his thigh. Yes. Right? And I actually have, and then my other leg is in an awkward position because I'm actually changing directions. Okay. I go up one way, I cross, and I go up, and I shoot the layup this way. That's why the other leg is not where normally it would be. And I have a photograph that someone gave me. That's a classic photograph. It's, I think it's Daryl Dawkins. And I'm going up. I, I remember the play because I remember I remember as a dunk. I'm going up to her, and you can see my right or left foot on his stomach, and I'm pushing off him to dunk with my left hand. You didn't see the entire play. You just saw my foot pushing against him. But I remember the play because I, I thought it was a pretty amazing dunk. But people that saw the dunk, they didn't realize part of the ele elevation came from me pushing on his body to dunk, <laughs> to dunk the basketball. Is, is that called cheating? I don't know. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. So now here you are. Uh, this is a great, great accomplishment. Do you talk about this? It is, and I, I, I was talking to a group the other day of some friends. And we were talking about, because I'm a member of the High School Hall of Fame, National Hall School, High School Hall of Fame, the NCAA Men's Basketball Hall of Fame, the Wisconsin Athletic Hall of Fame, the Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame, uh, and then some other Hall of Fames I'm a member of. And they asked me, they, they pointed to the James Naismith, right? This is the James Naismith Memorial, Basketball Memorial Hall of Fame, which is, we know, is the, the highest honor that you can receive. Right. But I still, the Southwest Conference Hall of Fame, I'm a member of. I forgot yeah. about that. But I still say the greatest Hall of Fames for me, personally, uh, were two. And one was the Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame, because I'm from Arkansas, and then the Wisconsin Sports Hall of Fame, because I played in the state of Wisconsin. And it actually trumps, not in prestige, but in how I feel about them. Those are very, very special to me. Of course, at Naismith, you don't get any. <laughs> this is about as high as you can get right here. And it was, it was a big honor. It represented all the hard work, <clears throat> great coaching, tremendous teammates, and timing that I experienced during my years of playing the game of basketball from the time I was in college. <clears throat> Someone gave me a stat, and they said, 
in the last three years of my college career, and we play a lot of games, he said, Sidney, you realize you only lost nine games. Wow. And I knew we had won a lot. I knew we didn't lose many games because my first year we lost maybe eight, nine, I don't know. And then after that, we were just, we were just rolling. We were rolling. And that's pretty amazing. I always felt that the Naismith Hall of Fame should be not just your, your pro accomplishments because it's not called the National Basketball Hall of Fame. That's what people misunderstand. It's only baseball has their own Hall of Fame, pro baseball, pro football has their own Hall of Fame, but the NBA does not have, which means you're in competition with people from all over the world. All over the world. All over the world. You can, you're, you're in competition to the great female basketball athletes. You're in competition with the executives from each team, the officials, high school coaches. It's a lot of competition. So this is a great award. I'm there with two of my favorite coaches and people, Coach Dale Harris at the bottom, Coach Don Nelson, who <clears throat> Coach Harris coached me at Milwaukee. And when he was an assistant coach, Don Nelson, Coach Don Nelson drafted me. And later, Nelly uh, left the team and Dale Harris became the head coach. So he coached me. He was my head coach at Milwaukee. And then we became assistant coaches under Nelly with the Mavericks. And then we became assistant coaches under Nelly with Golden State, if I recall, with Golden State. I think, were we together with Golden State? I thought we were. Uh, but yeah, Hall of Fame, Nate Smith, big, big time. Awesome. Let me ask you a couple of rapid fire questions here. Uh, have you been watching The Last Dance? I have not. You have not. So, uh, but you're familiar with the time, though. Right? Yes, I am. Yeah. What, uh, so, what was it like defending Jordan, Bird, Maverick, um, excuse me, Magic, and Isaiah during that time? Ah, they were just, uh, first of all, Isaiah was, Isaiah just never gets enough credit. Uh, just to to nation to nation's tough, you no know, talented, high yeah. basketball to to play the game of basketball. Really, I'm just going to maybe really as well as anyone. Awesome. And when you consider when you consider offensively, all the things that a player could do, he encompasses everything. Isaiah, Isaiah, because he could drive. He could shoot threes. He could pull up, shoot twos. He can cross over, shoot. He could pass off the dribble. He could pass stationary. He could beat you in transition. He had speed, and he had the basketball savvy. It's a very, very uh, <laughs> capable player that people don't understand. But if people went back and just watched him, they would say, wow, this guy. And then Magic, Magic was Magic just from, he was my roommate for a short period of time. We play on this international team. He, just think, the guy, his size, but not on his size, his basketball knowledge. And then he was, he was a skillful player. It wasn't like you see all the flashy passes, but Magic understood. He could post you up, and he knew when he had an advantage. I always felt I could guard him pretty well when he was on the perimeter. Uh -huh. Man, when he took you inside, that's when, that's when you felt the disadvantage you had. <laughs> well, he had that hook shot, too. He had that hook shot. That he had a hook shot. He had a drop, a jump hook. Uh, he had size, and he, he had more speed than people realize. So very difficult, difficult guard. Larry, one of the smartest players to play the game of basketball, gritty, gritty, tough, mean, competitor. It's like I got to the games early. Okay, so just said you had you had a 7.30 game. 7.30 game, they want you there. They want you in the gym maybe an hour and a half before the game, maybe an hour and 40 minutes. <clears throat> an hour and 40 minutes, people would start coming on the court shooting. I might get there 30, 40 minutes before that. Okay. Michael might get there two hours before that. Bird might get there two and a half hours. So you know, you see the level. You might be you might be at your shoot around at Boston Garden, and you're doing your shoot around. Boston has already done their shoot around. You might look up, and guess who's jogging around the the, the corridor? Larry Bird. 
Seriously. <laughs> you know, we have a, he's trying to get his conditioning up after they had practice. And I played with Larry six weeks with international basketball when I was in college. Okay. So I got a good taste for his skill set. But one thing about Larry, he's unguardable. Because he, he could post you, he had a little jump hook, didn't have a lot of speed, he didn't need a lot of speed. He had six nine and he had a high high release. And he knew when to shoot it, how to shoot it. He could catch one of the very few players that could catch and just boom right here, just one motion. Yep. And all was gone. So he was someone that I couldn't guard in the NBA. And then Michael was Michael was my just speed, athleticism. Basketball IQ, way, way high, high basketball IQ. They don't talk about that a lot with Michael. It's normally about his athleticism and all athleticism. But Michael would sit there. I knew how he played, so I'm sitting there guarding him. In the first quarter, guess what he would do, Coach Herb? He would just sit on that weak side and just kind of not doing anything. Seriously, not doing anything. He would let everyone else get, get involved early in the game unless it was just a unique situation. And you can just about count on him to make sure that you're paying, you, he makes sure you still paying attention to him. Because he, if he ever just got over and said, well, Michael's not playing, he'll just flash real quick across the paint and post up and score the basket. So I would sit over there with him and I knew if I relaxed, he would make a cut. But I also knew that he was not going to get involved early. But then when he got involved, he was all, it's all, it's time to say, help, 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 because <laughs> it's all you could do pretty much when he got the basketball. So that's a summary of all those players. Good. Hey, let me ask you, uh, let me ask you one final question. Uh, give me your Mount Rushmore, meaning your top four all-time EA players. I had a discussion with this someone today. I think you, we can do this by air, which you won't have time air. I don't think you can, I just think every player is so different. Uh, just say, why don't everyone have a conversation about Kareem being the greatest players ever, player ever? He only won how many games in high school? So, I don't know, some 80 oh, straight? What's it? College, how many huh? championships did he win there? How many championships did he win in, in college? How many, how many NBA titles did he win? Uh, so I, it's kind of hard, you got you know, like top 10 I can probably give you. But I'm going to miss someone because you certainly have to put Will, you have to put Bill Russell in there. You have to put Oscar. You have to put Kareem. You don't. You, now you can start maybe working to Michael and then Magic, Bird, and Bird. Bird. Bird gets overlooked. He gets overlooked. Then you have to put LeBron uh, somewhere in there. Kobe offensively. And when I say top player, I'm talking. I'm talking about guys that play offense and defense. Oh, both of them. Yeah, both of them. But a lot of times, though, Coach Herb, they, when they say greatest player, they don't think offense. Yes, yes. But you really can't have one without other to be a great player. I, uh, I interviewed Derek Harper. Let me tell you who his four was. I was like, whoa. He said uh, Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain. Uh, then he said, I guess I have to throw Michael Jordan in there. He was trying to think of the last one. And the last one, he said, was Akeem Olajuwon. Okay. And uh, I said, wow, that left them. You left a lot of people, but you will lose a lot of people out because that's, that's, there's a lot of good. The player, and, and, and Keen Lodge one is a good choice. You could easily say someone that played offense and defense yeah. and won and did it the right way, he would be on my top 10. Well, I want to thank you, uh, uh, Sydney, for uh, being with me and hanging with Herb today. Uh, well, thank you. In closing, I always like to honor my parents, Lee and Cree, and I uh, encourage us all to unite and uh, give someone a smile. That's okay. right. Here's my smile. Uh, <laughs> so with that, I'll say Zikomo, which is translated thank you in Zambia. All right. Well, thank you, Coach. I appreciate you. Thank you, ma'am. Bless you. Have a great one now. Bye. All right.
hanging with her.